So welcome, um, and uh, this is David Roach. And just to introduce how how this happened, that we're interviewing this amazing man, is that years ago I read an Anne Lamott book, and she mentioned this amazing man in the book, which then made me immediately go out and get his book, The Church of Eighty Percent Sincerity. And I devoured that book. I think there's a post-it note on every page of that book when I read it, and um, and. It's very rare that I get myself to follow through to be like, I have to write this person. I have to contact them and tell them how much this meant to me. And with David, as like, I just immediately wrote him. And we stayed in touch over email sporadically for 12 years now. And we were going to try to meet in person years ago when I was in Portland and he was traveling from, I think, California up to Vancouver. And it didn't end up happening and so I was like, still thinking one day, somehow we're going to meet and yeah. it's finally happening. And I'm so excited because <laughs> you are one of my heroes. So truly. You're very kind. Thank you. Truly. So I want to start off because as I, 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 I mentioned, um, you know, I was watching some of your talks and there was one thing you said, um, you said, my face is unique but my experience is universal. Hmm. And I it was just, I wanted to know, like, could you expound on that? What did you mean by that? Well, that's a great question. Thank you, Paige. Uh, and I think that looking at something like that, uh, it gets a little complex. But one thing I discovered, it took me years of performing. I thought, um, People would tell me, oh my God, you're so fantastic, you changed my life. And part of me always thought, well, they're just being nice to the facially disfigured guy. Mm -hmm. But after you hear nice things a lot, you start to take it in. And one of the things I realized that people liked about me was that uh, the reason is that everybody feels disfigured. My belief is we all have a little place inside of us where we feel the, the guilt and shame and fear and put ourselves down. And uh, I feel that because I have a facial difference, I've been forced to deal with that. And so that's what I do on stage, that it is possible to deal with your feelings of being less than. Um, so that I serve as a beacon mm -hmm. simply because I have lived the life I have. So when I first started out, I thought I was a comedian and I would make jokes about my appearance, like, uh, oh, my face is like a Ben and Jerry's ice cream flavor, you know, stupid mm -hmm. stuff. People did not like that. Mm -hmm. They liked it when I was myself. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's that's kind of the longer answer than you probably wanted. No, so, no. We yeah, like long yeah. answers. <laughs> I love hearing you talk. I love hearing you talk. Like, cause you're we'll get to it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I okay. have a lot of questions. Yeah. Yeah. Your story and just your whole being and your personality and who you are it just i feel like just your presence just melts something in people mm. because you're so um gentle and so um i feel like you like everything you just talked about like you help everyone to see themselves differently mm. you know and and in a more loving way <laughs> well, I'll certainly take that as a compliment, Nomi, so thank you. And the fact is, it's absolutely true. I have this superpower. <laughs> and uh, everybody, I think, has a superpower. And the question is, are you going to use it? 
how you learn to life the ways that you have a sutra tower. Come on, and David. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to be making like 50, 50 memes just from your quotes. I'm telling you. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the lesson is true. And now, and it's great to feel like, you know, I don't prepare for this podcast. I think I, well, I just come from my knowing you, Monique, and having that connection over the years. Mm -hmm. But I feel like I'm totally present and I love it. And it's, going to be great and I feel confident and you know what I'm humble in my arrogance as well as, <laughs> <laughs> as I, I have like arrogant humility and humble arrogance <laughs> it's like I don't know if you remember that t-shirt back in the 80s it said it's hard to be humble when you're as great as I am <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's a song that Oh Lord, it's hard to be humble. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh goodness. I told a story of at age thirteen, I was the oldest of seven Irish Catholic kids in the Midwestern United States. And I was very intelligent, high IQ and a good boy, good boy. And so what are you supposed to do? is supposed to become a priest. Mm -hmm. um, so I went to be interviewed by the Holy Cross Fathers at uh, the University of Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. And I told them, you know, I'm, I'm just sitting there, my dad was with me, the two, the two priests, you know, they're interviewing me and um, I, uh, uh, told them how much I love Jesus and how my Aunt Rose had leaned over my cradle and said, this boy is destined to be a bishop. I, I didn't know what I was doing there. At age 13, to be saying, I want to be a priest? I mean, that's bizarre. Mm -hmm. um, but what happened was, the priest said, they left the room for a couple of minutes, came back and said, uh, we're sorry, but uh, because of your unfortunate appearance, uh, you cannot be a priest because the congregation would not be able to have any respect for you. Wow. And what I had been nurtured by nuns and priests at Our Lady of Grace School, mm -hmm. they said, you're a child of God. They said, they said you are a soul. That's who you are. Mm -hmm. So I didn't think, well, I am a disfigured face. I thought, I'm inside. There's something alive inside me. I had no idea what it was, but mm -hmm. it was encouraging. And then all of a sudden, what I am hearing from these two priests, who I was taught when the priest speaks, that's the word of God. Right. So I was hearing God telling me that I was a monster, a monster. And it was just like getting hit with a two by four. So there, right there is the edge of like having that really beneficial stuff of, of, of childhood and schooling and then getting hit by a, God to him, a monster. So that, that was kind of like a nexus point. I, I will say that I am now at this point in my life, looking back at my Catholic background and seeing value in it. I, mm. uh, at one point in my life before I met Marlena, my wife, I made, uh, I decided I'm just like losing myself to women. You know, I just do what women want and I need to think of well, what do I want? Mm. So I made, so I made uh, a list and one of the things on the list was uh, I wanted someone who would respect my spiritual background, as I was around all these new age people. <laughs> and here I am, I, you know, I believe in experience, guilt, shame, evil. I believe in evil. Mm -hmm. Oh, come on, David, you don't really believe in evil. Mm -hmm. Well, actually I do. Um, so uh, I, 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 I wanted, I've always tried to acknowledge that. You, you can't spend 18 years of your life being indoctrinated without mm -hmm. having that affect you. And, mm -hmm. and there are good things about it, of course. Mm -hmm. 
who I've learned from my parents, is the the heart and soul of Christianity is like give drink to the thirsty, mm-hmm. clothe the naked, feed the hungry, comfort the afflicted, you know, love your neighbor as yourself, which is what I've learned to do because I had to learn to love myself. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and it helped me to love my neighbor. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, and, and I'm looking back now and seeing what I, what I got out of that. Uh, and and saying like, yeah, that's why my whole life I've been altruistic and trying to do good things and help other people and knowing I can do that. Mm-hmm. I got that from Catholicism and as exemplified by my parents a lot and family. Mm-hmm. That's the kind of, it wasn't my, there's this part of being Catholic, you mm-hmm. sinner, you're going to burn in hell because yeah. you thought, you thought about sex. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know what's amazing too is the fact that um, there's a there's an amazing poetic justice about your life because of the fact that like that someone would say something to you that made it seem or tried to tell you um, you know and and then and said it as a as a quote voice of God. But actually, your whole life has been a, a ministry, and it's been um, your you are a, 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 an like a light post of God's love to so many people. And um, just seeing, you know, like the way you affect those kids, and it's to me, it's so it's so reflective of Jesus yeah. being on the cross, and and the very thing that would make someone think, oh, that couldn't possibly be God um yeah is the very thing that is what makes it true do you know what i mean mm-hmm. and and just to see like the the effect that you're having i don't know where your video just went i think i just okay you I don't know okay. Where it went. yeah <laughs> you're like i don't want to have any more thing more to do with this conversation <laughs> no um but that's what's so beautiful to me it's, it's just beautiful that someone said this to you yeah. this this is you this is not what you are and yet god's like well actually <laughs> god's using you in all these amazing ways that that no one probably could have ever dreamed of you know and there are ways yeah. that no one could have maybe foreseen in the way that you've done it you know like the way you're using writing and art and theater and film and you're doing it through all these mediums it's just ama- it's yeah. amazing thank you yeah, and it took me a while to get here, of course, you know, I had to wait sure. through a lot of stuff to get here, you know. Sure. Yeah. Uh, but I've always been surrounded by love. I've always had people who love me. Mm-hmm. I got, I'm trying to look back at this stuff now. Yeah. I kind of stay in the Catholic vein, if that's okay. Mm-hmm. I, I remember... Uh, yeah, I was a communist for 12 years, and I didn't give away my soul, but I kind of like rented it out a bit, you know. Um, and, uh, um, you know, there were some good things and there were some bad things about that. And afterwards, the organization fell apart, and I was in a spiritual crisis. I weighed 115 pounds. Now, I'm a little guy. But that, not that little. I was smoking two types of cigarettes a day. I was drinking lemon flavored vodka a lot, mm-hmm. you know, so drinking and eating, surviving on donuts and coffee. Um, this is so bad. But... <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> so I, uh... <laughs> yes. And, and so that's my spirituality. Donuts and coffee. That's it. No, I, uh, I, it was a spiritual crisis and I had to figure it out. And I finally, I, I tried woman church. I, I went to a gay Catholic church. And, you know, nothing was really there. Um, uh, and uh, I finally realized, I thought on my own, that, okay, what I need is nature, loving relationships, and my own creativity. And so I was like, yes, I figured it out. That's what I, oh, and live music, yeah. Um, and uh, I thought I figured it out. But then 
after a year or so, I realized that's what the nuns were trying to teach me, the Catholic idea of the Trinity. There are three persons and one God. But then actually, it's not like a concept. It's real, exter my experience of the sacred, of the divine. First of all, it's in nature. That's God the Father, creator. And then love. That's God the Son, Jesus. Love one another. Creativity. That's the Holy Spirit. And David, so like, I, I can't with you. I know. Right now. Isn't I it can't. amazing? David. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? This oh. I now that you've just said that I, that, I remember this is the thing that made me go, this is why I know you're my soul friend. <laughs> <laughs> because yeah. wow. I used to write down that to me, the places that I most experience God, there's three places that I believe God is the most visible. And that is in nature, mm. in his creation, in loving relationships and in creativity and the arts. And so I remember when I read just that you'd read, and I just was like, oh my gosh, this is somebody that's, that has said it is mm. the same thing that I was feeling. And when, uh, anyway, so I'm just so excited <sighs> that you're talking about this. Oh, yeah. And I remember when I first realized it, I was doing a presentation at a Catholic school, St. Mm -hmm. Isabella's in California. And uh, it, it's a kind of new Catholic school, but none, there's no more nuns, you know, but there's, you know, teachers. And, and mm -hmm. uh, the kids really loved it because they got it. It's, all, it's mm -hmm. daily life, you know. And the teacher, there was a teacher who started crying. And I thought, like, oh, thank God. So, it, uh, yeah, and it's one of those really common sense, obvious insights to me. Yeah, what do you like? Well, I like the Cedars. I like Monique and Tage, And I like being creative. Hey, I found God. Oh, Don't oh you my think? gosh. I love that. It's, I think it, it's a perfect time for me to ask because okay, David. I personally, <laughs> I've never, I've never been in love, but I am so curious. I love hearing people's love stories. Uh -huh. How did you meet your wife? <laughs> I, I like it. I like it. How did you meet your wife? <laughs> Not I, subtle. Uh, <laughs> no. Um. Uh, we were both volunteers in this pioneer program at a hospital in San Francisco that ended up being the first massage therapy program in a hospital in the United States. Mm -hmm. So that that's something I feel really proud of. There were like seven or eight of us. There was another guy there for a while, but it was mostly women and me, as is often the case. I, it's, either it's all men or it's all women. And... Uh, yeah, it's interesting. We all started having our period at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> that was inappropriate. Inappropriate, I know. <laughs> Anyhow, so that uh, we we uh, were, this is in the, during the AIDS epidemic in San Francisco. So all these patients have AIDS, and we're going in and touching them, and it's incredible. Mm -hmm. um, what what we're doing, we're, it's healing. Mm -hmm. and patients tell us it wasn't the doctors, it was you. And uh, so, uh, and so that it was like a perfect situation for me. Mm -hmm. I've been doing good, you know, like the, I like to do. I'm a good boy, and uh, in in a community of people with the same values, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and, and it was touch. And at that time, I was like learning to be into my body more and more. And I was doing massage, I had been to massage school, and I mm. really love this. So we have to learn protocols, contraindications. We have to practice with each other. Mm. So, uh, because you have to be careful with incision sites and bandages and, you know, everything. And so, Here's Marlena. I'm I'm on the I'm the side table and she's practicing. Here's the moment that it happened. Uh, she starts to touch my face. 
Mm. Nobody touches my face. Mm. Nobody even sees my face because my face is a secret. I never talk about it. That's part of the way I survive with denial. Right after that time, here you say, wait a minute, you talk about your face all the time. That's pretty boring, actually. But there I I hadn't. And 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 that her hands and, and I wanted that hand on me. Uh, and uh, so I got that incredible healing touch. And I give the healing touch and, and so wonderful. I start falling in love with her. Oh wait, she's married. And after six months, basically we're doing this, it's like six months of foreplay. <laughs> you know? And it is and it's like full body, full body sensuality is like wow, 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 <laughs> wow. And uh, <laughs> That's what it sounded like. Um, <laughs> then I uh, fell in love and finally, uh, you know, I, yeah. So I, I got to the point where, uh, you know, I wanted her. And mm -hmm. uh, I remember, uh, yeah, so that we started seeing each other. And, and this was very disturbing to her. I was not married at the time. Uh, and uh, and uh, Nalena was in a marriage that was ending, not legally, but, you know, emotionally. And here I am, uh, you know, a soulmate. And we're soulmates. So what are we going to do? So we start having an affair. And sometimes guys get it, okay? <laughs> Once in a while we get it. And it was like, yeah, I get it. And so we've been together 33 years. And wow. so it was, it was touch, you know, it was touch. And we had like a long honeymoon. Oh, and now, uh, yeah, now it's not like that, you know, no. Now it's watching TV and kind of having our thighs together, you know, that's, that's it. It's still good. It's all good. Yeah, it's just so amazing because of the the work you do together and it's just all of it. It's so it's so beautiful and it's so obvious. It's just such a sign of love in the world, you know, and I feel like the world needs to see people who are unified in in a in a purpose in a in something that they're doing together and that genuinely truly love each other and committed to each other because it just is there's so many stories of the opposite, you know, and seeing it's just such a sign of God's love to see two people who yeah. love each other and stick together. So beautiful. I, you know, I just to be clear, we fight a lot. Okay, we're two strong personalities, very creative, we supported each other. I didn't get on stage until after I met her. Um, and she has started uh, her decaying get deeply into her healing practice she's done that for like 50 years now mm. so you can imagine what it's like to have her touch you i don't get massages i don't but i've learned tricks i like i put my head in her lap you know and then you know and she, she starts like mm -hmm. <laughs> that's a tip yeah Talk a little bit about this um, getting on stage, because you said I didn't know that you didn't start doing that till after the two of you were together. Mm. I have to do something for myself. I took a class and called. But at that point, I had quit drinking, which was a really key thing, you know. So I'm sober. I, I got society. I got love. Who am I? I took mm. this class in the comedy of recovery. The whole idea is don't tell jokes, just tell the truth about your life. That's what's funny. And I, so I did. Oh, and here's another story. The first gig I ever had was at an adult bookstore. Uh, not bookstore, it was an adult stuff store in San Francisco. <laughs> it was called Lay Down Comedy. And I had, it was like six comedians and I had like a, a 10 minute set of 12, something like that. I would never been done this before. Uh, and uh, so I, 
I go to the store and uh, the deal is they pay $15, they get a, one glass of champagne and the show. And so I go up there and <laughs> this is my first time on stage. Everybody <laughs> has had one glass of champagne. So they're all kind of tiddly, but they're not drunk. Right. And on the walls, there's dildos and, you know, wow. was all kinds of things, you know, it's a sexually charged environment. Right. I look out at this crowd, there's not many people in this little store, maybe 30 people, and they all have this dead mind. Oh, like, oh, they all have that look of like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, two hours from now, you know where we're going to be. Um, it's like, you know, that look you give your secret lover at a party. Yeah, just wait, <laughs> just wait. Uh, and and so, the, and here's, a, I'm on stage. I'm looking out at all these people who's like, oh my God, they all want to have sex with me. It's so nice. And so it was, <laughs> uh, uh, and so it's a great way to start being a comedian. So mm -hmm. that was like my first audience. They all wanted to have sex with me. Oh, yeah. what a great start, eh? <laughs> And that was and then I started, I had to learn that, uh, not to make jokes about myself, not to make fun of myself. Mm. Uh, yeah. Oh, my God. Son, you guys, I'm having fun. <laughs> I thought I was going to be crying for other reasons. And I'm just like, oh me too. I keep going back and forth between tearing up and something really sad, stretching and moving and then uh, comedic moments. It's like, but this is what yeah. I love about you and your writing. <laughs> That's what I love about you. It's like one minute I'd be, it's like with Anne Lamott. That's what I love you. There's a similarity oh, between yeah. writing. I, where it's like I one minute her. I'm reading it and I'm like laughing. And then the next minute I'm bawling my eyes out because it's so moving. So yeah, that's an incredible gift. Um, so I was wondering, I just had some like kind of different questions in terms of just for you. And I think this is, it's helpful for everybody to ask maybe this question to themselves every now and then, because I think uh, in general, we're so inundated with what we should be and what we could be mm -hmm. and all this, but, and, uh, but like when we think about what about who I am right now and, and who I've been throughout my life. And so this is maybe not the easiest question to maybe sum up a quick answer to, but what do you like best about yourself? Oh, I, <laughs> I am funny and I am so charming. I am, I know I am, I, when I turn it on, I'm irresistible. I know, I, I know I, I can do it, you know? And, and, uh, and let's not forget humble, humble. <laughs> oh yeah. And uh, uh, intimate and vulnerable. How vulnerable can you get to confess to your arrogance? That's real vulnerability. Yeah. <laughs> and to be yeah. proud of that too, of that confession. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I do. I am. And uh yeah, I all those things. I I what can I say? I I it's in, in recent years especially, you know, I'm I'm doing uh uh I'm writing and I'm going back to stories that I, I wrote, uh, that I, I told like the, the story about the priest. I'm going back to that and uh, looking at, uh, writing it and remembering it on the wall of the room where the, I was being interviewed. There was a, the, a, a big picture of the sacred heart of Jesus, mm -hmm. with Jesus with a knife in his heart and the crown mm -hmm. of thorns and I said like, I look back on that and I think, wow, is that what I was inspired by? You know, is that what I wanted to be? Well, I guess so in some way, but it, uh, I'm just looking deeper. I, uh, uh, I, there's another story. Uh, I, I'm glad I'd love to read it to you. I should send it to you. Um, yes, please. I was uh, a communist and uh, went, uh, we're invited to speak. We want to get out the vote in San Francisco. I know this story. In, huh? I said, I know this story. <laughs> well, you know, well, yeah, there, there it is. Uh, and I, 
uh, and, and you only the right person for like half a mile around. Yes. And, uh, you know, and all of a sudden I'm realizing that, and this is not a Catholic church. This is like, you know, Catholics, the most isolated church. You lift her in church, and if you say something loud, you get a slap on the side of your head. <laughs> um, but here, people are talking and shouting and singing, and there's a band, you know, and they're laying down a heavy beat, and uh, it's it's joyful. And mm. I have to give a talk, a three-minute talk, and this is a big honor to get offered the pulpit by uh, Reverend Kendrick, and. But as I go up there, uh, all of a sudden I remember, uh, some years previously, I had been walking outside a middle school in San Francisco, and there was a group of girls, mostly black. And I, as I walked by, I heard one of them say, ew, he gross. And it was just like one of those things that like, oh, I'm just getting hit. And, mm. and it was such like a perfect, Ew, he gross. So I, I had stuck that with me. And, you know, it's the kind of thing you wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and you say, ew, he gross. Mm -hmm. um, and I realized as I was walking up to the top that, that I was exposing the left side of my, my disfigured self to everybody, you know, a couple hundred people. And, and, and it hit me. And, and then the resident said, welcome to the house of the Lord. And I got up there. And I look out at this crowd, uh, and it, it looks like a moving abstract painting because mm -hmm. people are standing up and they're waving their hands and they're, 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 they're blessing me, you know, and they're saying like, hey, all the things that you say, amen, you tell it, brother. Yeah, like, uh, talk uh, about all, it, David. <laughs> yeah, you can like, right. yeah, do it, do it on, come on, though, you know, <laughs> and, and uh, that's what a lot of me and her's conversations were like. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and 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 so I, I I had been trying to memorize what I was going to say, and all of a sudden I can't remember anything because I'm caught up in this, mm. and and I and the, these people are blessing me and they're calling upon the spirits, to, you know, they, they're like encouraging me and mm. it's just like impossible to resist. <laughs> and so I, I, you know, and every time I say something, it's like, you know, say it's Jesus, you know, and, and, and getting all this, and what happened was, as I go back and look at that story, I realized that was where I found God. Not, oh, shit, this makes me sad to think about it. It was so moving. You know, God had always been like the, you know, you better be a good boy. You know, mm. you're going to go to hell. And all of a sudden, it was a whole different God. Mm. It was like God holding me up. It was God mm. carrying me, lifting from the low, not pushing down. Lifting, mm. carrying, blessing, so good. And you know, I say, that was a moment when I realized what the rest of my life could be right mm -hmm. then. Wow. What a gift. So you know, I'm looking back at the, the gift that I have been given. Like that moment with David, that moment in the Third Street Baptist Church in San Francisco. God. I'm at the age where uh, linear time doesn't have much meaning. Mm. So, you know, to go back to that, uh, I live in soul time. So it's not like, well, that was in 1986. No, mm. it was like, it's like, I, what, I, I remember what my soul wants me to remember. Mm. They say like, okay, we're going back to church now. Mm. You know, that mm. sort of thing. So it's a great life that I have right now. Mm. It's a great wow. life. So yeah, those are the kind of things that I'm looking at now, finding like everything in my life. Touch, love, presence. I, I, I had so many people who had faith in me before I had faith in myself. Mm. And I know, and, and, and all those people told me, you changed my life, you're so fantastic. Yeah, 
It didn't come to me. I had been doing my show for a couple of years, and this rabbi had asked me to come and do the Church of 80% Sincerity during the high holidays. What? Okay, I'll do it. And uh, it was in the middle of doing the show after I'd been doing it for like a year and a half. All of a sudden, this epiphany came. I realized, wow, this is a great show. And I'm a great performer. Mm -hmm. And I've never lost it since that mm -hmm. time. Never wow. lost it. So then that's, that's a lot of my life is still with things like that. That's my spirituality. Evidence. The evidence of it. Hey, open those, open those pearly gates, because here I come. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, it's interesting, isn't it, that um, because I think in, in our, in culture in general, it's not really accepted to accept oneself and to love oneself because, you know, uh, I have a lot of conversations with people about Jesus said, love others as you love yourself, True. not don't love yourself, not, be Amen. Down on yourself, you know, and so I think that it sounds like arrogance to say, I like myself, mm, mm. <laughs> but it's actually the normal state that we should be in, you yeah. know, and so to hear you talk like that, it's so, it's so <laughs> inspiring and so uplifting because people need to hear that, you yeah. know, it's, I mean, okay, there is a level where it does can, can go into arrogance when you think you're better than everybody, that kind of thing, but to just have a healthy view of oneself and be able to go, just like I would say to a friend, like, wow, you're beautiful. Why can't we say that to ourselves? Yeah. Why can't we say to ourselves, you know, I like you. I like your personality. You Especially know? when you have friends who like you for who you are, why can't you like you for who you are? <laughs> yeah. You know? I say about that, you got to know it, you got to grow it, you got to show it. How's that? Oh, good. Because that, that's a, that's where the duty comes from inside, but you got to show it, you know. Mm -hmm. If you don't show it, then the people don't know it. Yeah. Um, do you have any, like, um, thoughts for, because I really feel like the way when seeing you speaking to kids, you know, and, and kids, and especially kids at that, that age where they're just like, they don't really know yet who they are, and they're kind of like looking to their peers. But I think most humans don't really ever outgrow that and yeah. so um you know just maybe if you could touch on a bit of the kinds of things that you say when you're speaking to kids mm. but that apply to everybody in terms of um self-acceptance i mean you've talked about it a lot already but self-acceptance and and even the way you talk to them about yourself, you know, when you're, when you say to people, you know, go ahead, ask me, mm -hmm. I know you want to ask me, you know what I mean? Yeah. That kind of thing. And just like, you just put it out there. Like, I already know what you're thinking. So, but then to flip that back on an audience to say, you know, just, what happened just, to your face? Yeah. 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 They, kids like that. Here's what kids and the focus I think for me is like, on a 12 year old, uh, the beginning of puberty, and it seems to begin a little earlier all the time, you know, because yeah. you can see 10 year olds are into like dressing up and makeup, all kind, and the pressures are on them a lot. But I think the, the focus for me, the perfect audience, is a 12 year old girl who is trying to just start to try to figure it all out. Mm. And, uh, and, uh, you know, what am I? How do I want to say this? Um, the kids like humor, they like authenticity, and they like physical. So I move, I move when I'm up in front of them. And uh, I think uh, that uh, one of the things they like is, uh, here's a story that might help. Uh, I, I tell the story of how I was loved by my family. I, that's how I started out, King David. And uh, my mother used to say to me, uh, honey, David, you're so smart. You could do whatever you want to be. And that was something that she'd say to me a lot. Um, and that was sort of like a thing that instilled some basic confidence in me. So I would tell that story, and I see the audience like that. And then so I decided, well, I'm going to say that to the audience. Mm -hmm. And I say, 
Other way, honey, you're so smart. You could do whatever you want to do. And then I realized I have to say that right to the kids. So when I, in my Love at Second Sight, and you can see that in the film too, mm -hmm. I'll go up and I'll, I'll get like uh, about two feet away from a kid and say, honey, you are so smart. You could do whatever you want to be. And I'll do that three, four times. And the kids totally light up. Mm -hmm. I know I carry some creds with me because I've been on stage there and I'm kind of showing off to them. But just saying that, just saying it. And, and it's not even you're so smart. Uh, it's like a new vibration. I mean, mm. you're so smart. You, you know, that's like God's voice when you talk like that. You like yep. it? Mm. Uh, there was a few years ago, I got an email back from a girl that I had said that to, and she said, when you told me I was so smart and beautiful, I believed you, and now I know that I'm smart and beautiful. But mm. I never told her she was beautiful. <laughs> she figured that out for herself. Oh, I, I love that. Just being looked at and and spoken to yeah. with eyes of love and a voice of love is like That's like God's thing. voice is in there in the in the bits that like you like what you didn't say, but God was saying something in the midst of yeah. what you didn't say. Oh. Yeah. So that's, you know, uh, so, that's the kind of thing they like. And, and, and interesting, um, I tell a story about I'm in seventh grade and I'm playing uh, at a Halloween party and I didn't know it was a Halloween party and they're playing Skin of Violence. Uh, oh my God. What? And uh, so the caddy is the tedious girl in there and so she's the first dinner and of course it points right at me and she says, oh, yeah, not you. And she reaches the skin again. And then when I tell the story, I said, I know her. I was so embarrassed. But still, I could look back at Daddy and say to her, Daddy, I know you want me. And uh, <laughs> and, 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 and I, I do as I say, like, hey, people tell me, you're not supposed to talk like that to 12-year-olds, you know? And I say, no, no, they love it. They absolutely love it that I could say something because they totally identify with yeah. me and that I, I can go out and say, like, I know you want me. You know? <laughs> and, and you know that every, everybody hearing you is like, gosh, I wish I could do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then another time that I, I, I'm talking about the first kiss with Marina and, uh, and uh, then afterwards I, I say, well, what really happened was after uh, I, after I kissed her, I, you know, I stood up and I said, like, oh, yeah, I'm really sexy, you know, and I kind of strut across the stage. And the kid just screamed with laughter. And that's another one. She'll say, you can't talk like that to 12 year old. <laughs> yes, I can. They like it when I talk like that. There's a, a seven, a 70 year old man strutting across the stage saying, oh, yeah, I'm really sexy. Oh. <laughs> yeah. oh I love it. Oh my uh, God. When I shot Happy Face, that was so much fun. Mm -hmm. At one point, it was a shooting like at two o'clock in the morning, and uh, there's a, it was a, this, it was a Halloween party, and we we're all supposed to had get shots of uh, us dancing, uh, and it takes a long time because they have to change the set and all kinds of stuff. And uh, here's me, uh, the old man, 72 years old, kind of sitting front over in the corner. And I'm the oldest one on the set, like 30 years at least. And I know all these young kids are looking at me and saying, oh, God, that old guy, I don't think he's going to, I hope he wakes up. And, uh, <laughs> and then I, got the, I got the call, and I, I'm a, a fantastic dancer. And, and I got on Michael, Jan Michael Jackson outfit. Yeah, I'm like, woo, woo. <laughs> All the players want to play, 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 play. All the haters want to hate, 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 hate. I'm just going to shake, 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 shake it off, shake it off. And, and, so, and then so I danced to Michael Jackson, you know, mm -hmm. 
and I, you know, did my hat too. And then as I danced right into the family and did a flat spread. <laughs> you know? And so, and uh, so all the all the, and, and she's like all these young people on set are like, Oh my god. And I said, Yeah, I shouldn't do it. I shouldn't do it. That was so much fun. There's oh there's the there's the, there's the humble arrogance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. David, um tell our audience a little bit about this film that you were in. Happy, happy Face is a story of a 19-year-old boy whose mother is dying. She's a very lovely person, but she's got cancer of the face. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he can't deal with it. To try and get help himself, uh, he bandages up his face and comes to a support group for people with facial difference. Mm -hmm. um, He's accepted, and it's a good group. But then he's outed, and uh, in and they're all angry at him. You lied, you cheated, and then uh, and then he tries to say, "Well, you you folks, you need to be more brave." And, and he tries to take over the group. He's trying to learn what it's like for his mother, who's been so lovely and who now is disfigured uh, and is dying of cancer. Uh, so it goes to various adventures like that, and uh, you know, uh, everybody has their story. Uh, there are like half a dozen actors of facial difference, two of us. Uh, E.R. Louise, he didn't work in Hollywood, he's a uh, biracial, uh, uh, African American, and Nicaraguan. So he's got dark skin and he's got a burn down the left side of his face. So guess what kind of characters he gets to play? Yeah. Total badass, you know, yeah. thugs and criminals and stuff like that. Mm. Just, so he gets, so he's in a whole different role. Oh, he's yeah. such a nice guy. He really taught me a lot. Yeah. I love him. Yeah. And uh, anyhow, it comes uh, to the end. And in the, in the uh, story, my thought is really written so that I become like a mentor to Stan and convince him I take him into the hospital just as his mother is dying. And so he has a death scene where he's, he's healed with her. And is that, so the, it's a flawed film. It's, you know, got crazy stuff in, mm -hmm. you know. And at one point, I, there's a drunk guy making fun of me in a pizza tower where we're all sitting and uh so i go up to him and i go eh! you know and uh and he's like um and i i you know i, I did that the director said do that thing you do with your tongue and I, oh shit i don't want to do that yeah so there's a shot of me doing that you know mr sexy eh! <laughs> Um, I have a question on the film is I've been trying to figure out how to um, how to how to watch it. Mm. And is it is it not been distributed distributed yet in in Europe? Because it seems like it's kept saying like it's only is it only in the US that it you can uh, stream it or watch it? Uh, is in the US it's on Amazon Prime and it's on, in Canada it's on iTunes. It's mm -hmm. also on YouTube and other. So, mm -hmm. I, I I don't know the story in in Germany or in uh, in uh, the yeah. EU. Okay, because uh, sometimes there's like a block. It, yeah block yeah. in certain countries where if it hasn't been distributed yeah. there. So, but I really yeah. want to watch it, and I I've watched the you know the um the trailer yeah. for the the trailer, but also the crowdfunding uh, trailer and all that. And it just yeah. looks so good. And I'm just like, I really want to watch it. And I know that it's gotten a lot of write-ups and all these um, Hollywood reporter and all these things. I mean, you're a superstar. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> I was, was going to say, this is the part where you go like this, David. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, so I... I just want to, because like we're winding down now and I just, um, I enjoy you so much. Your stories are just so moving. 
I was very curious to know, because I know you're going to have a great answer for this. I was so curious to know <laughs> <laughs> if you couldn't tell me, you know, your name, your say anything about your gender or what, uh, you, do. what you do for a living. And I were to ask, who is David Roche? What would you say? Hi, uh, I'm David Roche, and I uh, I am you know like this uh, highly charged persona. I'm a symbolic persona because of my facial difference and because of who I am. Uh, it took me a long time to believe in myself, but I do. Now I've been, I've been a performer for 33 years. I didn't start until my 40s. Uh, yes, I'm 77 years old. I know I don't act like it. I engage in age inappropriate activities. Um, but uh, I create uh, and I'm myself. Uh, my favorite thing I think is to uh, deal with uh, 12 year old kids and to talk to them about what it means to love yourself mm. and uh, and to, to exemplify that and not to teach to them but to be to be to them. Um, I write, I've been in several films um, and uh, I, I, I've come to a place where I have an incredible life force. Um, and I just wanted to follow my heart. That's what I do as best I can. I work hard for love. And uh, I, I, that's what, and I've come to the point where I, I've done a lot of stuff around facial difference and I feel like, well, okay, I've paid my dues. I'm done now. What's next? I don't know. Here's what's next. I am doing a, a Heidi Latsky of the Heidi Latsky Dance Company in New York contacted me a couple of months ago, said she had seen me in a film and wanted to make a film of me dancing. Here I am 77 and I'm oh, starting yeah. a dancing career. Woo, woo, woo. So hopefully that'll come out soon and she's working on it. I sent her about. This is all shot in my living room, just me oh, dancing. My I, danced, oh my I danced, uh, you know, first I danced to Taylor Swift, then I danced to Dolero. <laughs> then I danced to Eric Satie. <laughs> and then I danced without any music at all. So mm -hmm. here I am. I feel like she asked me, Hey, would you do you want to dance? And I did, you know, that it's my secret fantasy to sing and dance, you know. So she asked me, and I say, Oh, yeah, I'd love to. You know, then a week later, it's like, What? Look at <laughs> that. But I do it. I go ahead. Yeah. I'm so looking forward to seeing that. I love to dance myself. So I'm yeah, yeah. all about, yes, me too. All, yeah. all about the groove. Oh yeah, I know that's where I grew up on. I grew up on, and I was like an R and D. That's that's what yes. does it to me a lot. Yeah, that's the kind of the, yeah. Come on, one day well, we're that, gonna have you and Paige in a room dancing. Come on, that's that I'm ready. Oh yeah, I'm ready. Oh that yeah, I'm so ready. Oh. I'm so oh. ready. Yeah, dance me battle. too. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know. I don't want this to stop, but it is stopping, I know. I know. Uh, so, I know. Uh, I, so I want there's to always continue. next time. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, anytime you want me, I'll Gosh. be there. Because uh, I love it. I love it. I love you. I, I love, you, love you. Thank I you so me. much, I, David. Thank you, Paige. Thank you, Mommy. Thank you for following up on a, a long time old connection. Mm -hmm.